Being a female business owner, where I come from, is not exactly easy. You get um, men making passes at you just because you're a woman. You're looking for business from maybe an organization and they feel like, well, maybe a dinner here or maybe a weekend there would <laughs> make it easier, you know. So there are real challenges that we face. The representation of women in entrepreneurship or business circles is very, very less. We see 10% women representation, that's a lot. Uh, the, the ratio is always skewed. I'm always in, in a room with a bunch of men. You have to find everything yourself. No finance, no support coming from anywhere. Fight the system, fight your colleagues, always having to prove yourself. It's, it's exhausting. Competent women aren't likable, and likable women aren't competent. Men can be both competent and likable, but women can be either competent or likable. You know, every person who moves up in the organization has to basically make changes, and changes are uncomfortable. And so what happens is, is that people become less likable as they go up through the hierarchy. Not everybody loves you anymore. And for women, we have been so inculcated that we need to be likable that a lot of times women will choose not to take that promotion because they don't want to lose that likability or they may hide their competence or, or reduce their the notion of, of how competent they are. If I were to generalize the biggest challenges that women in business have, the first would be defying social expectations. It's hard for women everywhere to show their executive presence and their leadership and be treated with credibility and acceptance. Because of what most of us see in the social world, which is that there are more men in positions of power than women, we tend to think a leader looks like a man. And so it's very easy to see leadership potential in a man because a man looks like what we expect to see in a leadership role. With women, we don't make the same kind of assessment. A, a woman doesn't actually look to us like what we think a leader is supposed to look like. So there's a tendency to default more to, does she have the experience? Has she earned the expertise? Is she qualified based on prior results? There are these expectations that as a woman, you sort of, you don't, you know, you shouldn't be too boastful or, or seem come across as too confident. You know, if a woman speaks too loud, she's aggressive. If a man does it, he might be seen as assertive and not necessarily. So it's those kind of, of things that you're constantly having to, to play with. When I got into the industry, I realized how biased the industry was. They didn't take me seriously. They probably thought that I wouldn't last. It's not, you know, a woman's domain to work in a male-dominated industry. But I think that challenge, you know, that drive alone was what inspired me to continue to go on just to prove people wrong. The worst thing is that I think they don't trust women, you know. They come, they say, oh, it's very, it's great what you're doing. Wow, I like it. Oh, you build women doing that. We're so glad to see that. They encourage, they, they congratulate. And when it comes to, to, to order the service to buy the product, they don't say no, but you can read in their eyes that, oh, I would never leave such a project in the hands of a lady. I function in an agri-business uh, field, and women in this field uh, are very rare. I think I've been mistaken for the MC or like somebody who's lost their way in a conference more times than somebody who belongs there. First, I used to feel bad. I'm like, you know, I used to get angry. Then I realized like later that I have to be me. And then people start taking me seriously. And also another thing I've learned is that I'm the most interesting person in the room because everybody is wondering who this girl is. What's the impact of your presence on other people? Are you showing up in a way that makes them feel that they can relax because you've got this? The other part of it for a woman really has to do with how to deal with the narrative in your head about the fact that you're a woman going into a male-dominated arena, that people may not respect you, that people may not know what to make of you, that people may underestimate you in certain ways. And that's really a separate part of working on a, your personal power that I think is very important for women, which is making sure that you 
take charge of how you interpret the situation that you're in. There are very few things that we can fully control in contexts like this. One of the things we can control is where our attention goes. And we can make the choice to think about the situation we're entering in a way that makes us feel small or ashamed to be there or unsure whether we can, whether we belong. Or we can choose to interpret the situation in a way that's empowering. It can be very helpful to focus on other things, to think of yourself as the most interesting person in the room, to, um, you know, think of the opportunity that's presented by people underestimating you. I think it's Angela Merkel maybe who said, you know, one of her greatest gifts is that people underestimated her and that's what allowed her to shine. So I think it's a very useful skill set for women to use their imagination. Earlier in um, 2017, they called us that, yeah, so you do qualify for the loan. But there's also the challenge of sort of like a guarantee for the loan. So you must have like a house of, or maybe some big property. If you, for instance, you married somebody who already has his name on his property, your husband's name is on the property. Are you now going to tell him that he should give you the property to go and give to the bank? Some of us might be able to produce, provide that, and still get access to the money, you know. But a lot of the women, they don't have access to collateral. So that cuts them out completely. We are looking for 700,000 US dollars. We want to develop the manufacturing line and open a new branch. With that, we are able to multiply our production capacities by 10 and uh, develop more than 200 eco homes a year by 2021. And of course, my hairs allow me to wear a helmet. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> The second big challenge, I'd say, is accessing funds. We just need more women investors supporting other women in business. Something that's interesting is that when men tend to ask for money for investments, they tend to overestimate projections. So they ask for more, and then maybe they won't get as much. Women are actually much more precise, and they usually ask for just what they need. So when they ask for that amount, they still might not get the full amount because there's an expectation that they, too, have escalated the amount they really need. So there's a nuance there that women need to kind of adjust to this dynamic and their pitch has to reflect that maybe they need to ask for a little bit more. Women negotiating face a lot more challenges than their male counterparts. They do so because there is a social expectation about how women should be in society and it really goes across many cultures. And that is that women should be accommodating, women should make other people feel good. And so what happens is, is that when, for example, as a woman, I try to negotiate, that makes my counterpart uncomfortable. That means that then they, they, the response is, they perceive me as being greedy and demanding and not nice. Even if I'm doing exactly the same thing that my male counterpart equally qualified would do. So if we had the same script, I asked for it, they asked for it, they aren't perceived as being greedy and demanding, but I am because my role is to make people feel good. The, the notion is that women don't ask. We now have a lot of research that finds that women, when women do ask, and a lot of women do ask, they still get less. So it's not parity. On average, men do better when they negotiate for self than women do. And that is even if they ask or don't ask, right? But when women negotiate for others, they outperform their male counterparts by 14 to 22%. Nobody calls me greedy and demanding if I'm negotiating for other people. That's something, you know, women take care of others. That's what I should be doing. When anything occurs, I will start to be very professional and I will start to be in a way that I hope you don't understand or you, you have like difficulties to reply, you know. I stay very high in my game and I know that it will just end the conversation. You always have to be tough technically because no one will ever reply to you if you have the technical answer. What distinguishes successful negotiators from their less successful counterparts is the quality of their preparation. Preparation is key in negotiations. It turns out that we're not bad negotiators. We just understand the social pressures that we experience and so it limits. And women are great problem solvers. Men are great problem solvers too, but they don't have the social pressure to sort of be a certain way that women do.
So the space that really excites me right now is women in business, and in particular, African women and entrepreneurs. And I see myself at some point trying to see how to support and motivate and encourage and inspire the younger generation of women in business. We are maybe like 98% women. It's a complete women empowerment. So we've been able to, you know, not just change the lives of the unskilled workers, but so many of the people who join us as teachers, those who, you know, label just a housewife to someone who is able to prove that she can make a difference. She can run an organization. She's running the center. It's been huge what we're able to do for our teachers as well. When I first started out, I would not go to networking events because I'd feel so out of place. And like, I would just skip it. Now I do make it a point to go. I do make it a point to take few women entrepreneurs with me. I uh, consciously socialize with women entrepreneurs uh, because our problems are different and we need to feel relatable too. We need to uh, find our tribe too. For us, um, we're proud of the things we've been able to achieve as women, as women leaders. And I think that the, the sort of synergy we've had among the women leaders, it's so great. The awareness is there, helping fellow women, you know, seeing how we can grow our businesses and all that. I think it's helped us. And so we're not alone on the journey. I mean, this requires a bit of, of cooperation and coalition building. It's very difficult for any of us to change someone's stereotypes through our own behavior. But what can make a difference is when we surround ourselves with people who treat us as though we're worthy of respect and admiration and competence. So that's what changes the norm. If people are always looking for cues about whether they should trust a person or not, and the way they figure that out often is by looking at how other people treat them. So yeah, it's, it's actually um, a much quicker path to change, not just surround yourself with people who will, who will help, who will vouch for you, but also to look for opportunities to lift others up. And this is something that I talk with women about a lot, you know, which is to say, look, you, you may not be able to stop people from interrupting you. You may not be able to get someone to treat you in a way that's more respectful, but you can behave in a way that makes, uh, makes it seem like it's more appropriate to treat another woman. And eventually that will change things for, for all of us. It's also the case that if you look at what predicts status and influencing groups, we're much less likely to get credit for defending ourselves than we are for defending other people. If I intervene on another woman's behalf, I get credit for that. I, I took a personal risk to protect somebody else. But if I protest at the way I'm being treated, it just looks self-interested and, and defensive. So it's, it's a quicker path to try to change the way others are perceived than to try to change how others perceive us. For me, in a woman is an entrepreneur is a soul because a woman can do a lot of things at the same time. Take care of baby, take care of, of the kitchen, make a lot of things at the same time. I think the fact that I was an only girl um, and I grew up in a home of three brothers meant that I spent my entire life sort of having to fight to be, you know, as loud as the boys and to still be <laughs> noticed. So that's a space I'm quite comfortable in. I'm not that you know, um, nervous about sitting at a table with only men. We have to figure out what are our superpowers? What are our strengths? Women in general deal with so much negative self-talk in their head. I'm not good enough. No one sees me this way. I'm gonna fail. I'm not the right person. I'm not experienced enough. What they should be spending the efforts on is creating a narrative that involves what they are really good at. I see a challenge as a challenge now, and I like look at it as a problem solver. Challenges doesn't weigh me down, but rather give me the room to keep on going, keep on striving until I get the vision accomplished. Once you, you go through all the challenges, you know that um, you've made it easier for women behind you to overcome some of these things that you've gone through them. I don't see anything as a challenge anymore. It's a calling. You just find ways of maneuvering and finding the solutions yourself. Times have really changed. You know, I see 20 years ago and I see today, 
and I'm encouraged by a lot of the other business women that I see. And you know what, we will make it, we can make it. They can join us if they want, they can help us if they want, but we are going. And the challenges are real, they are there. Um, so as they come, you deal with them and then we move on.